I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is PsychAx Better Living Through Psychology. The topic of today's short talk is understanding emotional detachment. So I thought this episode might be necessary after conducting a recent consultation with a well-spoken young man who watched my episode, How to Love Without Emotional Attachment, and who came away with what I considered to be some misconceptions about my message. However, I reasoned that if this intelligent guy had these misconceptions, then probably other people did as well and that maybe my message wasn't entirely clear. So I thought I would make a follow-up episode to critically examine emotional detachment, what it is and what it isn't. Emotional detachment is an incredibly useful skill. In fact, it might be the most important emotional survival strategy of which I am aware. And I approach the concept of emotional detachment through a Buddhist lens, namely through the realization that the universe is in a never-ending process of becoming. Everything in this world is ephemeral. Even now, the present moment is changing, is dying, is transforming into something else, which will itself change, die, and transform. Within this understanding, everything that we have will eventually be taken from us. So why cling? Permanence is an illusion in the world under the sun. Your property, your relationships, your incarnate being, you'll lose them all in the fullness of time. So how will you respond when it comes time to let them go? Will you give back what you had with gratitude for the time that you were allowed to spend with it? Or will you cling to it with an attachment that is as tenacious as it is futile? Futile because no amount of tenacity will succeed in holding something a moment longer than you possibly can. On the other hand, emotional detachment is a skill that facilitates surrender. And surrender is something that we will eventually have to do with respect to everything that we have been given, including our own lives. It's a way of holding things gently. And this is important because, as I discussed in my episode, Hold People Like Sand, the tighter you squeeze, the more what you're holding tends to slip through your fingers. Now, I need to be clear about something. Emotional detachment does not mean that you have no emotions. A complete absence of emotion, in my opinion, is not something we should be striving for. Unfortunately, many men do succeed in functionally divorcing themselves from their emotional experience. However, I believe that such men do so at great cost to themselves. This is because it generally requires some degree of self-violence in order to amputate a component of your lived experience. Of course, most men cannot do this completely, so they arrive at a place where the only emotion that they can consistently recognize is anger. Long periods of a kind of numb neutrality are punctuated periodically with intense episodes of anger and frustration. And that is no way to live life, my friends. For me personally, emotions make my life richer, more interesting, more enjoyable, more complex. I like having emotions, but I am also very emotionally detached. Emotional detachment does not mean that you sort of dissociate from your emotional experience or that you alienate yourself from your feeling sensitivity. We do not want to become unfeeling rocks. This is an extreme solution. That said, we also do not want the other extreme solution, which we might call emotional fusion. When a man is fused with his emotions, there is no space between his felt experience and his seat of being. In emotional fusion, the man is his emotional experience. If he feels something, he not only assumes that the emotion is justified, but that he must act on the emotion in some way. This person has to say his piece, or wears his heart on his sleeve, or generally rides the hedonic roller coaster. He's overjoyed when things are going well and heartbroken and despondent when things don't go his way. Such men have no emotional detachment and little self-control. And this is a terrible way of moving through the world for many reasons. In the first place, your emotions are not always justified. Inasmuch as the model of reality from which your emotions arise may not be entirely aligned with that reality. And acting on the basis of a flawed model is very likely to create pain and suffering. And in the second place, emotions change, even when they are justified. Emotions are like the weather. 
they're constantly shifting. Acting from a place of emotion often leaves you with consequences that far outlast the emotion that originally produced the impulse to act. And that's a very dangerous asymmetry. Like, you can make a decision in anger or fear or hopelessness once that will permanently change the rest of your life. It's not fair, but that's the way it is. Now, before I go any further, if you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message because it's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. You can also hit the thanks button and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you've derived from this message. It's your support that makes all of this possible. I don't do corporate sponsorships or product placements, so I really do rely on you guys to help me make all this happen. And I really do appreciate their support. Thank you. Now, what should we do instead? It's a better idea to find some middle path between these two dangerous extremes. And that middle path is emotional detachment. To begin with, it helps to not treat your emotions like they're precious. I discussed this in greater detail in my episode, Emotions Are Impersonal. People think emotions are personal because only they get to feel them. However, behind every emotion is a thought, and the thoughts that consistently create those emotions are impersonal. If I were to think the same thoughts and believe them to be true, then the same emotion would arise in me as well. So we don't have to consider emotions to be these inherently valuable jewels that are more meaningful or significant than other aspects of our experience. In my opinion, it's better to hold our emotions gently and to consider them in light of multiple sources of information, our reason, our senses, to decrease the likelihood that we're being misled. In this way, we can consider emotions to be a source of information among many other sources of information. And we can do this more easily by kind of observing our emotions at some remove. Like, you can remain still and unmoving in the seat of your being while simultaneously watching your emotions circulate through your body. That's what I mean by emotional detachment. It's like experiencing your emotions at arm's length. And this allows you to consider the information or even wisdom contained within them without allowing them to permeate your entire consciousness. If emotional fusion is like drowning and emotional amputation is like staying as far away from water as possible, then emotional attachment is like swimming. You're in the water, but you're not of the water. And this is useful because our emotions are actually really important sources of information for us. We typically need our emotions in order to make good decisions. Here's something you might find interesting. It's sometimes the case, usually as a consequence of some tumor or growth, that a person's limbic system, the portion of the brain responsible for emotional processing in mammals, must be surgically removed. As might be expected, these people don't experience emotions after these procedures, but perhaps more unexpected, they also develop a terrible time making decisions. Like if you were to put one of these people in the cereal aisle of a grocery store, they would spend hours debating what box of cereal to buy. They'll think, okay, this box is $4.25 and has a net weight of 22 grams. Now, this one's a bit less expensive, but its net weight is proportionally lower, so the cost per gram is actually two cents higher. That said, it also has more niacin per serving, so the two cent per gram savings in the one case might be more than offset by the relative deficiency in niacin, and so on and so on and so on. Do you see what I'm getting at? In the absence of emotion, there is only factual information. And the human mind is actually not great at keeping a lot of factual information in its working memory at any one time. This creates information overload, which in turn leads to analysis paralysis. On the other hand, a normal person just walks down the cereal aisle and says, ooh, lucky charms, and throws it in his cart and keeps on moving. People have to make like 10,000 decisions a day. And most of these decisions don't really matter. This is where emotions come in. One of the primary functions of emotions is to serve as heuristics in decision-making, allowing us to navigate the world by expending fewer cognitive resources. 
People who don't have access to their emotions struggle to make decisions, and that's because decision is an act of the will and has more to do with emotion than thought. So that's emotional detachment, the ability to observe your emotional experience at some remove. This will allow you to access the information contained within your emotions without necessarily acting upon them. You can feel the emotional impulse to act without relenting to it. This requires some measure of self-discipline, but like any other virtue, you strengthen it by practicing it. By not clinging to your own emotional experience, you will increasingly learn to allow things to come and go, which in turn will help you to be more present, more grateful, and ultimately more loving in your relationships. Hopefully, that clears a few things up. What do you think? Does this fit with your own experience? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've gotten this far, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You may also consider becoming a channel member with perks like the priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. As always, thank you for listening.